welcoming Amy Yin to Happy at Work. So this is a podcast that's all about employee empowerment, bringing positivity into the workplace, making people happier. And for today, our guest, Amy, maybe you could just uh, hand it off to you. You could sit, tell what you do, what you're about, everything about your, your new company, or not so new, but Office Together, and we'd love to hear about it. Thanks, Jack. And Michael, good to see you too. I'm excited to be on the podcast today. I'm calling you guys on during our recharge week at Office Together, which is a week that we give employees off so they can actually properly just start the new year fresh and excited. So Office Together, you can see from my Zoom background that we're software for the office of tomorrow. Uh, during the pandemic, a lot of people realized that the way that we get work done has fundamentally changed. And so a lot of uh, companies are foregoing the offices or using the office on a more flexible and part-time basis. And so Office Together provides cutting edge software to help you manage your hybrid office from desk booking to uh, vaccine tracking, COVID attestations, and just uh, getting to know, you're getting your team together to have fun in person on that more infrequent basis. Office Together does it all for companies. Amy, it's great to have you on the show and thanks for the introduction. I teach a professional development course at Harvard called The Positive Workplace. So we're, we're always looking for any little thing that's gonna make people happier at work. And with the transition to the hybrid, you know, and companies like yourself coming up and, and meeting those, those gaps and demands. Uh, what have you seen from people who are actually using your software on a daily basis? How has that helped people be happier at work uh, while they have to move, while they've moved into uh, the hybrid environment? What have you noticed? Well, there's a few things. Um, one, uh, people who buy office together have, are usually folks who are really fr frustrated that they're managing office attendance on a spreadsheet or a Google form. And employees hate that it's a ton of, of admin work. And so office together makes it like a one click experience to book your desk in Slack, see who else is going into the office and plan fun events for your team and make COVID compliance. So it's still not fun, but easy, easy to do and, and sinful. So it's um, a frustration removing tool. Uh, but number two is I think really employees really enjoy it because now they have a pulse of what's happening at the office. Before, if you showed up at the office, everyone would be there. Uh, but now when you show up to the office, you might commute from Jersey to New York for two hours and show up to the office and no one on your team is even there. So now Office Together allows you to look forward and see, oh, which of my teammates are going to be there? Is my boss going to be there? Or, oh, I see there's a happy hour or a guest speaker in the office today. Let me go plan my one to two days in the office this week around those people or those events. Um, people are inherently super social. And so the office is not going away but they want to use it really differently. And so if you want to really be strategic about the few days that you want to commute now that folks have moved farther and farther away from the office, uh, having that information about your hybrid office is really critical for employees to be able to really optimize their own schedule at each individual level, rather than trying to do um, a whole uh, company level uh, set schedule, which doesn't allow parents the flexibility to work with their kids' schedules, um, single people to plan their dates or their social lives and whatnot. Maybe, um, yeah, go ahead. Do you notice? Do you notice any trends in terms of do people come in and spend a full day, or are your clients do they offer flexibility? Hey, you could come in maybe in the morning and leave, you know, at uh, twelve o'clock, or come in at twelve o'clock stay. What what's like on that? Is there any kind of vibe you feel of like how people are working now, especially with Omicron? Yeah, it's a big trend. So I would say that on the most flexible end is going to be uh, tech companies who are very hesitant to put a date in the sand because they know that there's a great war for talent. And if they say, oh, you must be back on January 1st, that people might leave or have a rebellion. And so you see that with Omicron, like Google, Facebook, a lot of the big tech companies, their big return to office is no longer going to be in January. And they're not even going to set a new date because they know that it's such a sensitive issue and they keep uh, having to push out those dates. So a lot of these companies, they haven't had a return to office, but their office has been open for many months, sometimes over a year, because not everyone wants to work in their small apartment or with their kids around. They want to have some separation. What I've been seeing from our Office Together data is that on, in general, these co tech companies are seeing 5% 
five to 10% attendance on any given day. And so their 100 person office is seeing five to 10 people in it. It's still quite stark. And then um, if you move from tech to more of these like traditional industries, um, we serve a lot of companies in finance, fintech, law firms. They tend to have a little bit more structure around their attendance. And that's just the nature of their business. And people go into that work culture expecting that. And so what we've seen is a lot of companies will mandate like, hey, um, it's a fully flexible model, but what we want you to be in the office once a week or twice a week or Tuesdays, the day we expect finance to come in and Thursdays is the day we expect the accounting team to come in. And um, these people, usually they're coming in for the full day because they're trying to come in with the team together versus if you're on this extreme end with tech, it's people who just go in whenever they want because they want to avoid their kids. And sometimes that's all day, every day, or just in the morning um, because that's like when things are like they want to get like the most focused work in. And have you noticed any changes in productivity for the people the night that 90 to 95% that are staying at home? Have you noticed any increases or decreases in productivity that you're tracking? So I have reviewed research from other companies and um, the majority of companies are saying that they have seen an increase in productivity. Um, and most of that increase in productivity is coming from the two hours a day you're getting back from the commute. So before, if you used to spend an hour commuting one way, hour commuting back, now you're just taking that commute time and making it dedicated work time rather than like maybe texting on your phone or having to drive. That's where a lot of productivity gains are being seen. Um, the second place is uh, fewer unnecessary meetings. I have been really impressed by my own company culture, how meeting light we are. Uh, when I, when my last company is, you know, just typical, whenever you wanted to get something done, you put a meeting on the calendar, get it done. And for us, when we want to get something done in office together, I send someone a Loom video, and then maybe the next day or a few hours later, they'll type me in Slack or response or send me back a Loom video. But um, the need to create like a synchronous moment of time is just way less. So I, I meet like synchronously with my direct reports only once a week for a one-on-one, -on -one, but the rest of the week, we're just on Slack messaging each other and getting stuff done. And it's, um, it's amazingly productive. <laughs> That's really interesting. And on a, so I love the upside of that. On the flip side, since you had mentioned earlier that you know we are social beings and we get lonely, do you have any long-term concerns about people who are saying, hey, I just want to stay remote for the rest of my life because it's super convenient? Do you have any concerns that long-term uh, some things might be happening that we don't want to have happen? Yeah, no, and Michael, I appreciate you bringing that up because I bet my career on the fact that offices are not going away. <laughs> you know, I, I quit my job based off the fact that the office of tomorrow still is a physical place, um, but that people still need to get together. I have interviewed um, hundreds, if not thousands of HR and people leaders at this point, and even the ones who have been fully remote before the pandemic say that in-person is a critical part of their culture. And so it's been really hard for organizations because this is not the normal fully remote model right now, because even companies before that were fully remote would still get people together in person every quarter or a few times a year to like meet, socialize and, and bond. So one of the things that my company does is that we have awesome offsites three times a year. Um, our first one was in a surfing village in Panama. The last one was going to be uh, was in upstate New York in August. We we're going to go to Playa del Carmen in February for our next offsite. Uh, but we fly people in from around the world so that we can all like spend time together and just like co-work in the same place and do a bunch of fun events together. Uh, we're probably not going to be able to do Mexico in February, just given where Omicron is. But we're still going to go to Palm Springs and get folks together. And that's in addition to the fact that we have an actual office. Um, but we have an office that I don't go to because I live in San Francisco and our office is in New York. And um, that, I think that's another important part of making a really happy workplace is that uh, as a CEO, I'm setting an exam example to the company that you don't have to be in person at your own company to be successful. Uh, you don't have to be successful to be successful because I'm not even at my own headquarters. That's yeah. great it, to support you. We just, Jack and I just interviewed uh, along with Tessa who wasn't able to make it today. Uh, we interviewed the, the largest employment agency in the world, ADECO, and uh, the CEO, Alain, he said that 
uh, to your point, the office is never going away. It's, it, it will probably be a 50-50 situation where like that's going to you know, teeter a little bit uh, up or down. So I think you're, I think you're safe, according to Alain. He has 5,100 <laughs> offices, so <laughs> we'll go with that. Yeah, so, you know, um, uh, my research shows that less than 5 to 10% of companies went fully remote during the pandemic. Um, they all have maintained some sort of office but just not in the same capacity as before. Like my former employer, Coinbase, they went from you know spending tens of millions of dollars remodeling one of the nicest pieces of real estate in San Francisco, only to have the pandemic hit and they just got rid of it all and just returned it to WeWork before we even moved, got to move in. Um, and now they just have like a much smaller footprint. And so a lot of companies I work with, they have office spaces, but they are just, you know, shells of the former uh, of, of the former things they had you know they don't have like the fancy perks as the same before a lot of people don't even want to offer food because they're worried about covid and so um offices feel a little bit different like the main perk of an office is to get some face time in um it really uh is totally counter to the trend we were in before which is just like more and more perks like making the office your home like you can see your doctor you can see your chiropractor you can go to the gym you can uh, eat all your meals you can go to a woodworking shop i'm talking about my former employer facebook where you just had all these things on the campus and now the direction is totally reversed like yeah, these amenities are not the important thing they're realizing the most important thing is getting to see your team now amy you glossed over it but that to me it must be a gutsy move to go from coinbase <laughs> great company doing really well and say i'm going to bet the ranch on you know this hybrid model and start my own company can you talk a little bit like that's pretty courageous right yeah, um, it was definitely a journey. Um, I, first of all, um, I've, uh, my parents are very opposite. My dad is now a professional poker player, quit his job as a scientist to play cards full time. Are and we going to speak to your dad? That sounds awesome. Wait, maybe we got to get him on the show. Yeah, oh, he's wonderful. Um, he, uh, we also look alike too. So it'd be like, oh, wow. Wait, wait, wait. So he's a dad. professional. Wait, he's a professional. He was a scientist. A scientist. A scientist at, um, with a PhD in um, ecology, worked right. at the US Geological Survey with my mom their whole careers, only one uh -huh. job. And then um, two years ago, he was like, I'm only 55. I uh -huh. have the rest of my life to live and I'm tired of being a scientist. I, I need to go make it in the world as a professional poker player. I love it. How's he doing? And so, um, you know, he is earning a living, which is okay. an amazing, amazing thing. Um, as and so- As much as a professor or more? No, I mean, uh -huh. uh, I think that you have to kind of work your way up yeah. there. Uh, so, you know, he's not quite at the earning level he was before, but I think he's, um, he's on track to do it. And the thing is like, you know, on your high days, you make more than you, you would at the USGS, but on your low days, you know, you could wipe away a whole month's salary. So, so with that mindset, I imagine he's, he was very supportive of you taking yes. a chance. Yeah, he was always like, hey, Amy, we didn't raise you to be an employee. We raised you to take risks and become a CEO. And he'd just like call me on the phone all the time being like, hey, when are you starting your company? You still working at Facebook? Like start a company next. And then when I interview for new jobs, like why are you interviewing new jobs? Start your own company. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and so, so you, had, you had a little a bug in your ear. Wow. Which, Constantly, constantly. And, um, you know, the thing is, I'm still very much my, my um, father's daughter. Like for a long time, I was like, no, dad, I'm not ready. I'm not ready. Uh, but he accepted me. And so, um, you know, I went on this like journey at Coinbase, like working at Coinbase is like having like a full career in the three years that I was there. Um, so I did a lot of self work. I went through so many ups and downs, ups and downs with Coinbase, which has really, really prepared me well for being a startup CEO. Because things just like wash over me. They don't face me. I'm like, okay, three people quit today, man. Like kind of bummer, but fine. Like, oh man, like no sales this week because of Omicron, like, or whatever. Like it's fine. All, all these things compared to being in the madness of crypto um, just feel like, you know, like a, a ripple in a pond. So um, Coinbase really helped prepare me a lot. And then um, I got really into conscious leadership, which is something I had heard about through Brian, the CEO, and I got like a conscious leadership coach. And um, Coinbase funded some conscious leadership groups that I ran at, uh, point, at, um, at Coinbase for all the women engineers and a group of different women. And so I got to really like work on this practice um, and improving the self at Coinbase. So really, really, uh, that's like one of the biggest things I took away from my time there was. What, the what is that exactly though? 
Wait, what is so, that concept? Yeah, CLG, I, I would say in a nutshell, it's about being um, really believing that all the changes that you want to manifest in the world happen by starting with the self. And so anything that I want to see happen in the world, it, like if I'm like, oh, this person is being like annoying. If I make myself not annoying, all of a sudden that person stops becoming annoying. And it sounds crazy, but um, it, it ha it's worked every single time. And so all the things that I want to see different about the world, I change them about myself because that's the only thing I can control. And the world just magically kind of changes around me. And um, it's one of the things that I, I'm like most excited to talk about on this podcast about being happy at work because um, it was really, really hard. But now like adopting the 15 commitments of conscious leadership into my daily practice has totally changed like who I am as a person, totally changed my trajectory and made it possible for me to wake up every day and be the CEO of a very like, you know, up and down, com a company that's constantly up and down um, because of things totally outside of our control. So you seem to be talking a lot about uh, and I just want to verify this. It seems that you're talking a lot about an increase in resilience. Is that what the conscious leadership has helped you with, being more resilient with adversity? Um, I, I guess like I don't. I didn't think about it as resilience. I think that that's like one way to think about it. But I actually think that a more powerful way to think about it is it helps me reframe problems. And so um, in, in conscious leadership, there's a concept of a line. And when you're below the line, you're doing this dance of like victim, villain, hero, where like, you know, um, oh man, like my boyfriend didn't do the dishes, like he's the villain, I'm the victim. And then I'm like angry at him and I'm trying to like goad him into doing that versus like, you know, above the line, there's no problem. Like, it's just a fact like, oh, you know, um, he didn't do the dishes one time last night. Uh, and um, rather than, it takes a lot of the, um, like the heat, the, mm -hmm. the drama out of it. And so like, it's like, oh, I'm noticing, I'm feeling angry about the fact that for one time last night, my boyfriend didn't do the dishes compared to the thousand times he's done the dishes every single time in our relationship. And so it's, uh, it's less about resilience and more about um, changing the perspective from which I'm seeing the issue and making it just like another situation in my day-to-day -day, rather than making it like a really intense problem. Let, well, like well, a better that, reframe that's going to serve you better. Is that is that sure. also a lot of self talk? So that let's say that example with you with your you know boyfriend in the ditches, where instead of just immediately responding and getting angry, you just kind of process is that why am I getting angry? He didn't do the dishes. He's always done the dishes, and here are ten other things he's done that was really cool and really nice and really empathetic. So why yeah. am I getting mad at that? I shouldn't get mad. It's just dishes, and you kind of talk your. Is that kind of part of it? You just talk yourself through it instead of knee-jerk reaction, and then it That's makes right. the situation much worse. Yeah, like the first thing to do is acknowledge like, hey, I'm yeah. below the line. Like I'm noticing that I am not where I want to be with the situation. Um, and then uh, and then you kind of like work through this process. Like the exercise you kind of did, I call it, um, how is the opposite of my story is true? So if my story is like, he should do the dishes, I ask myself, how is it also true that he should not have done the dishes? And so, you know, I, and it's like, if I frame it from that point, it's like, well, he's really tired. He did the dishes every single night this week. Um, uh, like X, Y, Z, I can go down the list of like, and like, you know, he just needed a break for this night. Uh, all, all these different things. And all of a sudden uh, my story, like, oh, he should have done the dishes. Like it was so disrespectful. He didn't do the dishes all of a sudden starts to like lose its grip and it can no longer has this like hold over me and it, it just like loosens yeah. and it's like oh man you know I'm realizing I have a preference that my boyfriend would have done the dishes and I'm probably going to talk to him about it just so he knows how it makes me feel but I'm also okay doing the dishes myself uh, Amy and yeah I never put a label to it or name to it but I could totally empathize what you're doing I, this happens to me quite often and Probably shouldn't say this on a podcast so a lot of people watch it here <laughs> but with my it happens let's say with my wife all the time she may say or do something and my immediate reaction is like ah but then i'll say like, what's wrong with me and i'll because she's you know she she's done like the next thing about like she's done this 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 and all the other great things like why am i you know why am i getting frustrated at this one little thing and i kind of talk myself through it and then all of a sudden i'm like yeah i'm a jerk for even thinking that and it's it's like this mental exercise <laughs> 
Well, in conscious leadership, we would say that you're still below the line because now if you're making yourself the jerk, you, instead of making her the villain, you've made yourself the right, villain. Right, because I'm taking, why am I getting bothered by it? Like, it's such a silly thing. Like, right. why would I let it bother me given all the other things that happen? That, and that, from that's above the line, yeah. It's yeah. like, oh, like if this thing happened with my wife, yeah. I'm going to talk to her about it, yeah. clear the air, and then figure out like a way to move forward. And so um, it's really powerful because it means that at work, I show up way less reactive. Um, it's like it creates some space between yes. the um, the incidents and then this impulse, this reaction. It just creates like a little bit of space between those two things happening. That plus a lot of meditation. And um, it, it just makes it so much easier. And I actually think it's easier to do in an asynchronous world because someone sends me a Slack message. I might have a reaction and I can do my whole thing over here and they have no idea. And then <laughs> four deep breaths and then I can respond. So actually I kind of feel like we're cheating because in the async world, it's way easier to appear calm. Yeah. Do you so, do this, Mike? Do you go through this too? Uh, I, I do. I, I, I yeah. tell my students all the time, never hit the send button if you're feeling emotional. Yes, yes. No, no, yes. no high emotions because you'll be you'll be issuing an apology within 24 <laughs> hours that it's <laughs> <can't> coming. <laughs> so, Amy, on this thread, and I love I love this uh, this angle we're going on. How did you react when you know you you have this business that's focusing on optimizing a hybrid work environment? And boom, here comes Omicron. Oops, we're not going back to the office again. How did you, how did you respond and react to that under the, the conscious leadership thing? Yeah, well, um, I guess I'll talk about Delta first because um, with Omicron, I was a little bit prepped because Delta was awful for us. Um, so Delta hit around um, September-ish, like end of August, September. And um, what happened was we had tons of deals in the pipeline. We're having our best sales months ever. And then we had a goose of a month in um, October, which or September. Um, September, we had zero sales. And that is so hard for a venture-backed business because it's all about showing month-over-month -month growth. Hmm. Uh, and um, I was barely, I was really struggling in September. I felt awful. I was having dreams of just like what, like how to exit the business successfully. I was just uh, dreaming of acquisition. I was so, so scared because I was like, oh my gosh, there's zero demand for a product right now <laughs> because this is just like what the, like, and it's hard to tell because a startup really, really measures itself on all these like little hacks that you do to boost growth. And, and you know, uh, nothing we were doing was moving the needle. And so uh, we started to get really, really strategic about marketing. Um, and so we had a moment of break from sales. So I wasn't doing all these big back-to-back -back calls, talking to customers, closing deals. And so we really invested in marketing actually. So we started building up a bunch of our marketing infrastructure and um, we started running paid ads for the first time. Um, and uh, and uh, we started hiring marketing consultants, working on SEO, which is like a longer term. And then uh, actually um, that downtime transformed our Q4 into an even stronger Q4 than Q3, which was insane. Like we uh, almost doubled our ARR in Q4. Uh, so, you know, the September time wasn't sleeping horrible, I turned it into a moment of like, hey, like we have this like moment of calm, like the eye of the storm, like let's do something with this en energy to, to move the business forward. Um, and I'm, I'm really glad I didn't throw in the towel because I was just like, oh my gosh, do I even have a viable business here? Is this even a software someone wants? Um, to doubling our customer base in Q4 because um, Delta subsided. Uh, Delta's still here, you know, it's still uh, alive and well, but people are, people are becoming more used to realizing the next variant's always around the corner. Um, and then with Omicron, uh, actually the way we reacted was that we, um, dropped everything and um, we shipped vaccine tracking in one and a half weeks, which was just like amazing. Um, the team just got really focused and they're like, hey, like right now, like all the other features don't matter as much as getting vaccine tracking out because people really need to know who's vaccinated, who's boosted, who's not in the face of this like very, very contagion, contagious variant. So it's actually a really great moment of the team all coming together in the face of adversity. I love the pivot. Wow. I'm curious yeah. if you're 
if you've been considering, okay, we obviously don't know what the future holds and it's just curveball after curveball every day. I'm curious if you've, you've thought of uh, being able to pivot the business for certain customers that might say, you know what, we can't deal with this back and forth. We're just going to stay remote forever. And we want to learn how to be really good at that. Have you considered uh, creating services just for remote only? So um, vaccine tracking is actually one step in that. So we have an events, ma um, events management module where you could say like, hey, the company is all getting together for an event. Um, instead of like going into the office, you might get together and do like an offsite. And then the vaccine tracking allows you to actually uh, check people's vaccines and their COVID, and then eventually their COVID tests ahead of that event. And so that uh, that's going to work really well for a fully remote company because um, now it's like, well, any place in the world can be your office, right? The offsite is the new office. So that's one way in which we're helping. Um, but in terms of a full pivot, I was dreaming about that in September, man. When we had zero sales, <laughs> oh my God. I was like, okay, what else can we do? Should we build something else? Like, do we need to lay people up? I don't know. And it was only four weeks, but like it felt like an eternity to me. Um, but actually our customers love Office Together. Like our customers, the ones who are really committed to a hybrid model, just find Office Together so delightful. Like I had the other day, um, a CEO of one of the companies reached out to me on LinkedIn and, and was like, hey, like, can we chat? I, we, I, we've we been using Office Together for the last few months. Our workplace manager found it and I love the software. Can I invest in your company? Like, you know, the people oh, wow. who are really committed to hybrid are just super, super excited about Office Together because nothing like this has ever existed before. This is like the really awesome opportunity for a startup, like a small agile startup could really like swoop in and understand like the changing needs. And, um, you know, like what I say is like Office Together is purpose built for hybrid working versus like um, our, we have competitors who are seven plus years old with over a hundred million dollars of funding, but they're trying to retrofit their software meant for the traditional way of working and adapt it for hybrid rather than building it from ground up from a first principles perspective, or like what are all the new needs in this new world? And so it's actually a great time for, a start, for startups to come in because so many behaviors have sh shifted as a result of the pandemic. And what are people loving about your software versus your competitors? What are they, what are they saying? Um, it's delightful. It's integrated with Slack, right? Which is the tool that you're already in all day. It's super easy to use. And it has all these pro-social features that didn't exist before. So for example, like I can see when my team is going into the office, I, I get notifications when like my manager or people I've been trying to track down to get a PO signed are going into the office so that I can better coordinate my time in person with them. I can see like when the company is having like a fun event. So no, before like a company would have like a physical bulletin board being like, oh, here's like what's up and coming for this week at the office. Like here are the events happening. And now you have like a place to do that on the web, which you just didn't need to have before because everyone was going into the office every day and you knew for sure people would walk by the sign that had everything that was happening. And so it's like, um, like a virtual bulletin board. Uh, so th there are just like things that people are just super excited about. Like um, on a daily basis, we put people into a 24 hour ephemeral Slack channel of all the people in the office. And so those people can like all coordinate, like grab lunch together, court, like a, and it makes it like, it makes being in the office, office special and intimate rather than try to like be like, you know, if there's only 10 people in the office in a hundred person office, you don't want to message all a hundred people in the office. You want to message the 10 people who are there to actually like meet up and do something. And so it's about like making the experience of being in the office feel like really special and intimate um, because you just, you're just not doing it on a daily basis anymore. You know, I could give you some anecdotal uh, evidence that supports what you're saying. Uh, from the recruiting practice, I can't tell you how many people I speak to who tell me, Jack, this is ridiculous. They have a hybrid setup and let's say, you know, Monday, Wednesdays and Thursdays have to be in the office. So let's take the East Coast. So they'll say, I'm schlepping in through the Long Island Railroad, come into the city, you know, I have to, you know, worry about getting COVID on the subway, going on the streets, it's crowded, worried again. Then I go into the office and then I'm sitting there, I look around and there's nobody who I can interact with. So now it took me an hour and a half maybe to get in there, the cost of coming in there. And now I'm just sending emails and Zoom calls that I could be doing at home. And, and it just makes them irate. And in a war for talent, you know, great resignation era, 
people like that, they want to leave because they feel, you know what, just as you're saying, you know, you have this legacy way of doing business and trying to shoehorn it in and think they're doing everyone a favor. But instead, it's just really aggravating the heck out of these people. Uh, absolutely. And, um, you know, we've seen a bunch of homegrown solutions where they've replaced Office together with it, where they're trying to create like multiple different like calendars through Outlook or for Google Calendar. Um, we've, uh, I think that this has been a really interesting acceleration into the cloud during the pandemic because a lot of businesses that were paper and pencil, um, they weren't able to go to the office. They had to shift things to the cloud. And so Office Together is part of this like bigger trend of like more and more companies adopting cloud software because they're realizing that building it internally is just like not worth the hassle. Um, and that uh, really, really great companies, like even like accounting firms, like law firms, like these like older school industries are becoming more and more tech savvy. You know, we serve like PR firms, we serve law firms, um, uh, the gamut because uh, yeah, they're, they're realizing that uh, they need to have a more um, tech forward office in order for the business to survive this uh, shift in how workers wanna work. This is all great. The funny thing about this podcast is that time flies for all of us. And I'm seeing that we're, we're getting near our time, but there were a few other things that, that I know that you had wanted to cover. Uh, what are the things that you, that, you, that you want to share with us that we haven't asked yet? That's one of our Okay, of my yeah. <laughs> um, so I did want, I listened to the podcast with the F1 um, person and I thought that was super interesting. And so I wanted to share the four things that I'm doing for Office Together employees Great. to uh, have people show up happy at work. And so um, the number one thing you'll be surprised is that uh, start with the self. So before starting a company or before any job, doing a bunch of self work and um, making the self show up bright and shiny is really, really important at every single level, but especially as the CEO, um, the way I show up to work every day really impacts my employees, like how much they're smiling, how they treat each other, um, and like what the general attitude is at the work. And that requires like, you know, me meditating on a regular basis, like me doing all these things to uh, delight myself, because um, if I just overwork myself, then I show up super grumpy to work. I'm so unpleasant when I over when I overwork myself. Um, I love how you're so, so honest about everything. That's so awesome. You, you, a lot of times you don't hear that. Readers, you know, they, they gloss over you know stuff like that. So I, I respect I that know. so much. It's funny. Okay, so that's number one. Is start with the self. Um, number two for happy happiness at work is to hire great people. Uh, if you hire happy people, they are much more likely to show up happy at work, and it's infectious. Um, people who are so like happy to be each other with each other, social, show up to work, excited to get stuff done. They bring that energy and then they hire more people like that. And so um, hiring has actually been not one of the hardest problems at my company. Most companies, startups really struggle to hire great talent. Uh, it's on like my top 10 list, but it's not my top three list of problems at the, at the company. And so um, hiring great people is just like a, a flywheel. Um, and then I think the uh, second part of that was step number three, which is, is um, don't be afraid to fire people. And it might sound like counterintuitive for happiness at work, but I think about one of my favorite shows, The Office. And one of the main reasons people feel seem to be unhappy in that show is because they work with people they don't feel like are super competent. And so if you maintain a high bar mm -hmm. and you constantly manage out the people who aren't a good fit for the role, then it really, really uh, keeps a positive attitude of the workplace because you trust that every person at the company is um, running at the same pace as you. And that means that even though we're a young company, we've already managed out almost half of the company in, in the last year, year and a half. And then um, we've done like performance improvement plans um, and we've done a lot of contract to hire. We hire people on full-time contract and see how the, well they do and then only convert them to full-time if they're a good fit. So um, it's, uh, it's brutal, but um, you know, I learned from my time working in Paris that if you aren't able to fire people quickly, you just end up with a lot of lame duck employees that really negatively impact the company's culture. Mm -hmm. um, and then the last thing I wanted to say was um, honor work-life balance. So one of the commitments of conscious leadership is I commit to a life of uh, fun and play uh, you know, I value my rest and renewal as much as my work and everything else that happens. And so um, that's actually why I gave this, the company this week off, Recharge Week, 
uh, as much for me, honestly, as for them, because I need a time off. I was like, I need a break. I want to feel reset and I want to show up the first week of January hungry and just ready to kick it down. And I told everyone like, hey, like go offline this week because starting next week, we are going to be kicking off a great, amazing the quarter, like the best quarter we've ever had. And it's going to require everyone to be super focused and um, get ready for the intensity. So really, really uh, spend time with family this week. And so I love, those are the I things. I love all of these. And there, there's a lot of research behind it. You know, the starting with self, I find that people are mirrors. If I'm smiling, then you're going to smile. And if I'm grumpy, then, then I'm going to make you grumpy too. The hiring great people, there's actually some interesting data on hiring optimistic people because they have a thing called a, um, the optimistic explanatory style where basically it's, it's what do you say to yourself when something happens? And you can, there's a, Penn did a study with MetLife and to predict salespeople, salespeople right? that were going yeah. to do well before they hired them because their original process, they were getting 50% attrition. And they found that if you hired optimists, they <laughs> sell more, make more money, and they live longer because when they get rejected, they don't take it personally. They're more like, hey, thanks for hanging up on me so quickly because now I have more time to talk to someone who might be so that, that so the optimism and there's actually a, a, an assessment you can do in an interview called the lot lot r l o t dash r and the third one i wanted to talk about was the firing people hbr did a really interesting interview of ceos who had had to fire people and they, they said to all of them oh what was your greatest regret and they said not having done it sooner because to your point uh, they're contagious like you really have to protect the yeah. good people not just try to fix the ones that, that aren't, aren't doing well. So uh, I, I totally agree. I mean, the people that, I don't think anyone's really surprised when they get fired. It's, it's probably not working out for them either. I would yeah. be surprised if on a certain level it's a relief. But um, yeah, I think on the, op the optimist way to think about it is that by letting them go, you're giving them the opportunity to find the job where they can really shine and excel at, and that's not at the current job. Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. Hey. Amy, one last thing I wanted to ask for people who are watching this. It seems like you put a lot of thought and time into your mental outlook, your mind, uh, mindfulness. Are there any books or podcasts or things that you learn yeah. from that that people like if we could, so when we edit it and put it on there, we could update it and give kind of almost like a reading list? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. Well, Obviously, the 15 Commitments of Conscious Leadership is like this incredible book. I actually keep a bunch of, of, of hard copies at my house so that anyone who wants one can just take one because I'm really, really passionate about the framework and what it has to offer. And um, the, uh, the other book, so it's not quite about happiness, but um, I'll, I'll give it to you anyway. I, I live by this book. Um, there's two. It's the four-hour work week. And so it's about uh, how to really just prioritize and help you stay in your zone of genius and delegate everything else away. Um, and then the second one is never split the difference. And it's about how a lot of techniques from like nonviolent communication and conscious leadership are there because it's a lot about like when you're in a negotiation, how do you practice active listening and repeat back what people say so that uh, you can really um, have a conscious conversation with them where you're understanding their needs and coming to a, a win for all. So they're not the typical books um, you know, we might be thinking of. The 15 Commitments one is like classic, but the other two books are just, uh, just have been so influential in my life and my happiness. Well, that's great. That, that, that's so terrific. Amy, I'm so happy that you're on here. I think you gave such awesome advice. And, you know, I'm kind of like, I probably think you feel the same way, blown away how just open and honest you are and transparent about your wins, your losses, challenges. You know, a lot of people just want to put their best face forward and we'll talk about all the great things. But I think sometimes we learn more when people experience challenges and they overcome them. And that's kind of a better story. So I applaud you for that. And really, thank you so much for coming on. I think this was just awesome. It's fantastic. Yeah, yeah Amy, your, your transparency and especially your vulnerability, uh, I could imagine you being a, a great boss. Uh, oh. so if, I if I lose my day job, yeah. I call. <laughs> <laughs> well, please do. We are hiring designers, yeah. salespeople, marketing yeah. folks across the yeah. board. So uh, we'd love to have you. If you, you know what? We could also, in addition to the book, we could put, seriously, we could put on like uh, your career 
I'll put a link to your career thing. Oh, you know, too, great. Yeah, so careers.officetogether.com. That would be wonderful. Because they'll see the podcast and say, oh, she's awesome. And let's see, oh, here's some jobs. So, okay, be happy to do come that. Work, come work in office together and be <laughs> okay. happy at work. <laughs> yeah, excellent. What a good way to end it. Thank you so much, Amy. Awesome. All right, thanks, Jack. Thanks, Michael. Thanks. All right, bye-bye. Take care. Uh -huh.